Okay, so it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this session. So this is uh, Ms. Phạm Thị Thu Lan, and she has been working for the trade, um, trade union, like for the um, Institute for Workers and um, Trade Union in Vietnam. And uh, it is um, under the Vietnam General Conf Confederation of Labor. Um, this is the sole uh, umbrella organization for the trade union in Vietnam. And she has been also involving in the um, uh, trade union movement in Vietnam for 20 years. So she will be here with us today to share like, about the, the current situation of the garment workers in Vietnam specifically, and also share with us about the role uh, of the, the trade union in Vietnam and also the, the possible impact of the industry 4.0. Uh, so, um, yeah, so uh, Ms. Lance, would you please also let us know a little bit more about the situation of the government um, sector in Vietnam? Is there any um, difference or like uh, more similarities compared to also the other countries in the region? Yeah. Um, first of all, I'd like to say hello to you and thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here to share with you the situation of garment workers in Vietnam. And I'd like to thank Rosa Luxembourg for inviting me here to Berlin. Because in my thinking, Berlin is uh, the root of socialism. And uh, Berlin, under that time, assists us a lot. Uh, before I talk about the situation of garment workers in Vietnam, I'd like to say a bit about Vietnam. Vietnam is a small country, but with a, a high percentage of population, 90 percent, uh, 90 million people. And uh, Vietnam uh, start to uh, open the policy in uh, 1986. From 1986 to 1955, the policy start, started to, to, to be changed, to open the, uh, open the door for foreign investors. And foreign investors start to come to Vietnam uh, since uh, 1995. And mm. Because of that, the garment sector also boom. And now garment sector becomes uh, the second sector of export, mm. contributing uh, to the GDP of Vietnam. And it is one, uh, Vietnam is one among the 10 uh, largest exporter of garment in the world. And the major export market is uh, Europe, the US and Japan, and, uh, and uh, about 30% of uh, the, the, the FDI enterprises in the garment sector account for about 30%, but the export of the FDI enterprises account for 65%. So you can see that FDI enterprises play a very important role in the garment sector of Vietnam. And I give you some information about the garment workers. In the garment sector, about 2.5 million garment workers in Vietnam. And it, it, it is about 5% of the labor force, the total labor force in Vietnam. So you can imagine that the garment sector is very important. And 80% of workers in the garment sector are female because the employer, the, uh, they prefer to recruit, uh, uh, to employ uh, women workers. Women workers are hardworking and they are obedient. And they, in their in employer's thinking, they are less likely to organize a, a reaction or the strike than the men. And the, 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 the Average age is young, between 25 to, uh, th um, to 25 to 35 years old. So, uh, and the major, major, major brand in Vietnam is uh, the Zara, H&M, Levis, Columbia, Mercy, Pram. I bought some products in Pram in Germany. <laughs> so I'd like to say about the uh, working conditions in the garment sector. Uh, the first uh, problem, I think it is a major one, and it is the same in other countries, in Cambodia, in Bangladesh, in Myanmar, in all the garment, the export country of garment products. So the main product, uh, main problems is uh, wage, low wage, very low. You can see that the, the wage can only meet about 80% of the minimum living standards. And 
and and with this wage, the worker cannot survive. They have to work extra hours. And you see, when we say about the minimum living standards, it means it's very minimum. It's a basic for living a, a modest life, not a decent life. So uh, you can imagine that the worker has uh, three meals a day, but these meals is uh, poor nutritious, and they have a poor accommodation. They are all migrant workers from the rural area, and they stay in the city, and they share about two or three or four, even four, person in one room of about 10 square meters. So very tough con living condition. And uh, their wish is not enough for uh, their children's education. So many migrant workers they have to send their children back to their village and us have uh, asked their parents to help them, to take care of the children. And also not enough uh, for the medical treat treatment if they, if they are sick. So, and for your imagination, their wish is only equal, can only buy about 10 uh, thin uh, boxes of uh, formula milk for baby, about uh, 400 grams uh, per, uh, per box. So it's, it's only 10 boxes. So to survive, why, why they still work? Because they have no choice. Without working, they have, have, they have nothing to do. So they have to accept because of the, because of the, the employment. There is no employment in the rural area. So they have to move the city. So they have to accept. So in order to survive, they have to work extra hours. So extra hours, they work uh, about uh, 40, 50 hours a month. According to the regulation of Vietnam, the maximum working hours per month is about 30 hours per month. The overtime. Overtime. Working. I mean yeah. the overtime is 30 hours uh, per month. But not uh, on average, the workers in, sex start, uh, in the government sector, they work uh, extra hours of uh, 40, 50 hours per month. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine that after working hour, they are exhausted. They come back to their place and they just want to sleep. They even don't want to eat. And the problem is that uh, overtime becomes uh, regularly. According to the law, overtime only in unexpected circumstances. But here in Vietnam, overtime is uh, regularly, every day, every month, and all the year round. And according to the ILO, we think that this is a forced labor because if you work within eight hours, you cannot leave. You have to do extra hours to leave. That means a forced labor. And you can see that even so, the, the payment of overtime work is not paid in full. The, according to Better Work, Better Work program in Vietnam, they monitor, uh, they, they, I, it, it is a program uh, uh, implemented between the ILO in cooperation with the International Financial Corporation. And uh, they monitor the, uh, the uh, compliance of the uh, national standards and uh, international labor standards in the uh, government uh, factories. And according to the Better Work, 70% of the companies doesn't pay full in full the overtime for the workers. So it's a, a big problem. And also the social insurance. You see, the social insurance uh, means the employer have to pay, the worker have to pay according to the, our law. And it helps the worker when they are unemployed, when they are pregnant. But many companies, many enterprises, they avoid paying the social insurance for workers. And the worker doesn't know, only when they are unemployed, when they are pregnant, they discover that their, yeah, their insurance are not paid by the company. And now this topic become very common in the newspaper, very, very common. But you see that uh, the, uh, the punishment, the punishment is very low. Even the employer prefer to pay the punishment and then still violate still not pay the social insurance. It's in Vietnam, I also ask why the punishment is so low. 
and the lawyer say to me that because of Vietnam is a socialist country and the punishment is just to educate people, make them know that uh, it is violate the law and they don't violate anymore. So they have socialist thinking in punishment, but in the capitalist uh, system. So if you punish in a socialist way, education punishment, it doesn't work. And they prefer to pay punishment and they continue to violate the law. That is a problem. And I can give you the, 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 the figure for you to, to, uh, to imagine that uh, since 1995, there have been about 6,300 uh, strikes in Vietnam. And out of 6,300 strikes in Vietnam, 40% happened in the government sector. And mainly because of the violation of law by the employer. And at the moment, at uh, now, and one, one problem um, emerged. You see that uh, foreign investor come to Vietnam, came to Vietnam 15, 20 years ago, and they recruit all the young workers, uh, 20 years old, 25 years old. And now after 15, 20 years old, the worker become 35, 40 years old, and they start to work slower. Their health is bad. They, they have a back pain, and the pro productivity is low, and the, the cost of uh, the payment of uh, labor cost is high. The salary payment of wage is high. So the employer, they don't want. They want to replace the old workers with the younger worker with a higher productivity and lower payment of wage. And the way they, they dismiss the worker, they try to do it in a way which, which is not violate the law. They encourage the worker to, uh, to live by themselves voluntarily, and they supply them with, uh, with uh, some money. And they say to the worker that if you don't leave, we will dismiss you. It's better that you leave voluntarily so you can get some, uh, some money. Or they can close the factory. They move to another province. They erect a new factory in another province. And they, they recruit new workers. Yeah. And or they change or they can ch they change the name of the company. They change the name of the company and they, they open a new company and they dismiss the old workers and they recruit the young workers. And now there is uh, the risk of the unemployment for the government workers in Vietnam. Yeah, and like you just remind me of like um, because recently that is also a very very big issue in Vietnam, and we we hear like the discussions everywhere. So like uh, like what you said, many companies they they really prefer having like young uh, generations, and because they they are um, also young, of course they have less experience and less demand, and also like high productivity, and like compared to the others like uh, around 35, and it's really really um, the very big issues and like yeah. big challenges for those women workers because they are uneducated, yeah. and then like uh, after. 10 years or 15 years working in garment sector, they get some experience, but now they, they have yeah. nothing to, to hold on. So it's really, really big issues now in Vietnam. Yeah. Yeah. And um, also, like, I think it's really linked um, very much with another kind of like a national discussion. So we, we have been talking a lot about the uh, industry 4.0, uh, oh. and because we are living in the, the world of technology and like, how it really re impacts on the government sector, especially then when you also just talk about the, the dismissions of the, the, the female workers when they, they reach around 35 years old. Yeah. Uh, Industry 4.0 is uh, recently a uh, topic of discussions in Vietnam, just recently, since I think about less than a year ago when the ILO uh, published a research uh, with a warning that about 86% of the government worker will be replaced by robot. So Industry 4.0, I, I, I think that it is uh, for, the, for the workers, it means uh, total automation. In fact, automation is start, started in Industry 3.0, but total automation is with uh, Industry 4.0. And when we heard about that, we feel very 
concern very worried. That means all our workers will be threatened. 86% of the worker will, re will be replaced by robot. And you see Vietnam, it's not only the government sector, it's other sector, the shoe sector, the uh, electronic sectors, all these sectors which are, which are labor intensive and low skill and repetitive work. It means easily to be replaced by robot. So it's, it's a, big, a big challenge for us. And we, we study about it, how it can impact our workers. And we can see the two possible impacts. The first one is uh, job uh, displacement by robot. Uh, at, present, at present, we see that in the factory, already the employer start to introduce a new technology with higher productivity, and they don't employ more workers. Even they reduce the workers, but the productivity is increased. So that shows that automation start to take place in the factory. But we don't know at what level, what level. That is one challenge. Mm. And the second thing we think that uh, why they still use the workers? Because the workers are cheap, cheaper than robots. In one day, when the price of robot is cheap, yeah. they will not use worker. And you see the workers, we are always demand for wage increase. And the workers also cause industrial problem. We have a strike. We have a lot of industrial problems. They don't like, so they prefer robots. It's only the matter of, uh, matter of price, time, robot yeah. price now. So what worry us is also the government have not any policy about that. We don't have any policy about how to deal with uh, the automation. The second uh, possible impact is the job displacement because of reshoring. Because with total automation, we don't need workers anymore. The company can move back to the importing countries, uh, the, the companies, they can move back to the uh, importing countries to open the factory there because they don't need workers, they only need robots and machines. So reshoring back to the importing country, and it also caused a job loss for Vietnamese workers. And uh, I think that uh, now the main, the main question that the union have to think is what sector for the workers? If we don't have a government sector anymore, no shoe sector anymore, so these sectors are dying sector. So which sector Vietnam should move, should change? And the it's not easy because the workers, the labor force in Vietnam is a very low skill. And they are from the rural area. They have a less education. And they can only do the simple thing. Now with technology, how can they, how can they do it? So it's a, it's a very, very big challenge for us with Industry 4.0. Yeah, and I think like with the um, industry 4.0, uh, it doesn't change like only for the, the garment sector, but also in mm. many other um, fields as well. And I think, for example, in Vietnam nowadays, I, I've read a lot of different articles. They always have the title is like, um, which kind of job will be lost in the next five years or 10 years? But mainly, for example, when they talk about bankers, but those are like people who are also educated, so they have also skills, not only hard skills, but soft skills. But when I'm thinking about the, the garment workers, because when I talk to them and I, I ask them about the, um, the industry 4.0, and they say, like, we don't even have a time to, like, also money to, to eat, so what does it mean? Because we don't even have energy to think about it. So I'm not so sure, like, uh, I'm, I'm just considering what is the role of the trade union in this sense, also, like, how you can really also build capacity building. And when the, the government, like, the, the workers themselves don't even have a time or maybe they have interest, but how they can, like you said, they work for, like, eight hours, but plus how many other hours, four or five, sometimes they work up to 10 or, or 20, like, 12 hours per day. So I don't know, like, what is the role then? Like how you can really support them and also like with the changes? I think with Industry 4.0, it's not the worker who can deal with that. It's, it, it's because, because you can imagine that this generation of worker, they will mm. retire. But the future generation will come. So the problem is that's how to prepare for the future generation. And it is the worker cannot do it because it, it needs uh, to invest in the new sector. And the new sector, the worker cannot. They have no money. And the enterprise, they only 
invest in the sector where they find it's a profitable. They don't invest in the sector for economic development. So for economic development, for the sector which is uh, technology, uh, with technology, it should be the government. I think the government should have a role here. But you see, the government, they also think of economic development. They also think of economic development in terms of the profit for the short term, not for long term. Yeah, I feel that, uh, I feel that uh, without, without sacrifice, uh, thinking, I mean, without thinking about sacrifice, uh, the, the short-term benefits for the long-term benefit, you cannot change anything. Because okay. now, any policy mm -hmm. is because of the short-term benefit, not for the long-term. It is also the interest group as well. I, I can say that it's not only the matter of the government, it's matter of the interest group inside inside mm -hmm. the government and what you mm -hmm. ask about the role of the trade union uh, I think that our union we try to to protect the worker because at the present the worker have a lot of problems industry industry 4.0 is something is not directly affect the worker now but the the thing which affect the worker now is low wage bad working condition, unsecured employment. All these things need to be mm. turned right away. So we try our best to, to, to deal with the, the, the current thing. Uh, and, uh, and one thing we want to do is we try to participate in the law revision. We try to protect what is already in the law and we try to improve the law. And you see that in Vietnam now, the revision of the law seems to be on the side of the employer. That there seems to be cut of labor protection in the law. It is a tendency in other countries and it happens in Vietnam. I can give example on that now, the overtime limit. The overtime limit in law, mm. 200 hours per year. But the employer want to raise the overtime limit to 500 hours a year. And they have argument for that. They, they can hide many lawyers, hide many researchers to prepare argument for that. And I can see many research also support their argument. Even the GIZ, even the USAID. So it support their argument for increasing. And they say it, it is for the, for the improvement of the competitiveness of the economy. So that means they sacrifice the workers for the uh, competitiveness, uh, competitiveness of the economy, and and then all, all, all the labor norm. Labor norm means uh, the amount of the work the worker have to do in a month, and it is said in the law that they have to consult the trade union. They have to re register the labor norm uh, under the Department of Labor. But now the employer want to to remove on that. They say that labor norm is by the employer. The employer have the can 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 do it, can decide without asking the union, without registering to the Ministry of Labor. So they want to to lobby for cutting this uh, provision in the law. Or you can say the calculation of the minimum living wage. At present, the law say that the calculation of the minimum uh, living uh, wage is based on the uh, minimum on the living needs, living needs of the workers. But they want to change uh, to the calculation of uh, minimum living wage based on the minimum living standards. So living needs, different from living standards. Living needs means that you have to ask the worker, what is their needs? So they have to consent the worker. They have to ask the worker's opinion, involve the worker in the, in the process of uh, uh, deciding the level of minimum wage. But living standards, that means they exclude the worker. They ex exclude the voice of the worker. And they just involve some of the, uh, the organization, which is maybe on their own side, and they calculated the living standards. So that seems to, uh, that seems to be, the law seems to be changed in that way. Uh, and uh, we also, uh, the union also try to monitor the enforcement of the law uh, because, uh, and we, we, we try to, uh, to, uh, to organize, uh, to have a law sheet, 
Recently, we have a lot of lawsuits in terms of the violation of social insurance. The company refused to pay social insurance. We, we file a lawsuit uh, uh, to the company, to the court. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we do more, we also want to build the uh, awareness and build the power of the worker to make the worker aware of their right and they can uh, protect their own right. And uh, we also uh, uh, raise awareness about Industrial 4.0 for them to prepare for the, the, their, their children. So to prepare for their children, don't continue to join their parents in the garment sector anymore because it's dying sector. And uh, we try to, uh, to, uh, to do social dialogue and collective bargaining. But you see that social dialogue and collective bargaining in Vietnam doesn't work because of many reasons. It can be because the, um, the law is not complete. The law, uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, conciliation, the arbitration uh, doesn't have the collective bargaining. When the collective bargaining get to a deadlock or the union in a weak position, so no one have us. No one have us. And also the union is weak also because, uh, because uh, we have no country uh, based on the workers' power. We have the country based on the law. We used to work based on the law. And now the environment changed. We need to base on the worker, but we have no country for that. And we have no... Uh, uh, we are, we, are, we, we are in the political system, so it makes it difficult for us to use the workers' power to pressure the government to be in the political system. The union have advantage because we have the official voice in the revision of the law, in the policy of the government. Uh, but voice is only voice. It also has disadvantage because we cannot use the pressure the pressure to certain extent, but cannot strong pressure. And we cannot use the right to strike. It's very difficult to, to organize the strike when you, have, you are in the political system. Because the government, they always want investing, investment. So if you organize strike, so it's not easy. You have to ask, you have to see. Hmm. And uh, so, uh, so, uh, yeah, and also like you mentioned a bit um, like earlier, there has been like there have been more than six thousand strikes since yeah. like 1990s. 1995. 1995s, and as far as I know, none of them is legal. And so, could you please also talk a little bit more, maybe also about the, the political system in Vietnam, and also like also political status of um, VGCL, the Vietnam um, General General Confederation of Labor, so we can get a little bit more ideas and. Is it also like the challenges are coming also from the status or like how is it? So six, uh, more than 6,000 uh, strikes are illegal. It's illegal because it's not organized uh, according to the law. And it is uh, not led by the trade union. Uh, the law provides for the right to strike, but it is uh, lengthy and complicated. And it's difficult to follow this uh, lengthy uh, process when the workers' problem is so urgent. They need to be addressed right away. And, uh, and uh, it's not led by the union because, uh, you see, the union is, uh, uh, is uh, it's not adapt to the new environment. The union's change is uh, very uh, slow compared with the change of the economy. You see, in the past, the union think that, um, in the past, we only have a state-owned enterprises. And with the state-owned enterprises, the employer, the, the manager, uh, are also member of the trade union. So the union uh, uh, have the member from the management so that the union can, uh, together with the management, uh, uh, make the production uh, plan and produce and then uh, participate in the distribution of welfare. So that is in the state-owned enterprise. But in the market economy, the union still think the same. They still think that uh, we should have someone from the management into the union so that we can negotiate with the management. They don't think that we have to rely, to have to have uh, exclude them. Because uh, if in there are cases that the union exclude the management uh, out the union, then the management start to discriminate against the union leaders. 
they dismiss the union leaders by different way, by moving them to the security area, by moving them to other working places far away from the workers, or they can stop signing the labor contract with the union leaders when the labor contract expires. So they find all the way possible to discriminate against the union leaders. So the union think that, oh, if we don't ex we exclude them in the union, so they will discriminate, and we have not rely we cannot rely on the workers' power. So, so that is still the thinking. The changing the thinking is not uh, is not uh, easy because. Uh, Union leaders, they also need a job. They also need the employment income for their family, for their children. Yeah. So it, it's not easy. And uh, but I, because, because, because of that, the union cannot lead the strike. But what we do, the strategy we do, is that we encourage the strike, the spontaneous strike by the workers. We encourage the workers to, to go on strike by themselves. And then... When strike happened, the union jump in, and we have to solve the problem. In that case, the employers start to listen to union. The employers start to talk with the union. We cannot organize a strike, but we encourage the strike. That is strategy. We have to we have to find ways in this system. I think that the union in Vietnam is different in other country because uh, you have very uh, very clear cut system. Union is union, uh, government is government, employers employer. But in our country. It's not like that, so we have to find the way to do our role. And it's a big challenge for us to play our role in an um, environment which is very different from the environment of uh, your countries. So, yeah. So, um, you have been working and involving in the trade union movement for 20 years. Yeah. So, I think around like you start around like 1995 or something. So, it's just like yeah. a 10 years after the, the openness of, the, of Vietnam. So, what is the like from your own personal experience? What, like, what is the biggest achievements or difference like from that time until now? If you can say, yeah, I joined the union in 1994. Uh, at that time, at that time, uh, my country is uh, Russian speaking. I mean, uh, people prefer to study Russian, uh, Russian language, because uh, we have the support from Russia, and people uh, prefer to study Russia so that they can go to Russia. But uh, I have to study in the English uh, school. Uh, at that time, it's a disadvantage. People don't want. They all prefer to move to the Russian school. And I have to study in the English school. It is a disadvantage. Yeah. In the 1994, when I finished uh, university, I studied the language uh, using the English. And then when I finished, investment start to come, foreign investment come. And this is open for me, the chance to work for foreign investor. And I used to work in the uh, Singaporean uh, company. But then my parent, my father worked for the union. My father worked for the union and I like because of her, her, uh, his, uh, his uh, inspiration to me. So I want to work for the union. So I, I resigned from working for the uh, foreign investor to work for the union. And it's a lot of change since mm -hmm. I worked in, uh, in 1994 until now, a lot of change. I can tell you an example that uh, in the past, we dare not talk anything against the government, nothing, just a small thing. You are, you are in the blacklist. Yeah. A small thing, you are in the blacklist. And the word uh, freedom of association is never touched. Anyone touch the word is a problem for that person, and you cannot work there anymore. But now, we have more freedom to talk about that. I can talk about it more openly. I can also talk about that to the government. I can also criticize some of the revision of the law by the government. Yeah, I can say that. And I think it is a big change. And for the union, in the past, what the union do is that we all do everything the government say. We dare not do anything different. But now the union have a strategy. We do something that we think is correct. For example, the minimum wage increase. We, have, we raise the, the, the claim. We prepare the argument. We also say it in the media. And we demand for it. 
and anything we think it is important for workers, we can raise it to the government. Like uh, Industry uh, 4.0, we start to talk about that to the government. And we, we demand the government to prepare policy for that. Because if we don't prepare from now, when it comes, it comes. And we have no, no preparation. So where, where are we? Not only in Vietnam, but where are we in the global trend? So the government need to, to, to think about that. So we raise the issue about, mm -hmm. about that. Yeah. yeah, so I can see like even though there are a lot of challenges still, but then like we can also see some hope and also like the achievement, even though like um, still lots of restrictions and lack of freedom per se in, in our country. But then, yeah, so I really also value the, the work of the trade union and your effort. And so I think um, for now, maybe we can also, um, if you want to, to share, have anything else to share, we can also say. Otherwise, we can also open the space for the, the audience if anyone has any questions or any uh, clarification that needed. The, the last thing I want to say is that uh, what I'm witnessing now, what I'm seeing now is that uh, free trade is coming in Vietnam. And with more free trade, the more social rights uh, are eroded. And we try to raise awareness about that because once you lose it, you cannot get it back. Yeah. Sometimes people think that because it's not suitable now, we can lose it, we can cut that. And then when in another time, when economy develops, we can get it back, but it mm -hmm. never come back. So we want to, to raise awareness about keeping the social right, what we have in the law. We need to keep it. So mm -hmm. people have, all the people have the role. Not only the union, because the union is restricted to, uh, in, its, uh, in its role. It's restricted. So we need uh, the participation of other NGO, other organizations. And one more thing, because of the system in Vietnam is so different from other countries. Mm. So what we think is good solution is that we want the brand's uh, responsibility. And we want the NGO in the importing country to play their role, your role, in assisting us in demanding the brand's responsibility in the whole production trade, in the whole supply trade. And the labor cost should be a negotiation issue in the, in the order, in the price, purchasing price by the brand. Because so far, the, the brand doesn't put it as a negotiation issue. They just put the purchasing uh, price and all the company rush uh, to, for the order and they, they, they cut. What they cut is the labor cost. So I want it should be the negotiation issues in the, in the purchasing plan. That's one I think I want uh, your help in this. Yeah, because of the union in, inside the country is restricted to some extent. So I think, and also even not restricted in some other countries, still difficult for the union to demand it. So I think the brand's uh, responsibility is very important. That's yeah. why I want solidarity in this. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, but once again, thank you so much for being here with us and giving such a very informative and really nice presentation. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you all then. It's yeah. my pleasure. And I thank you for, uh, thank you for uh, wanting to know about Vietnamese situation. And I thank uh, Rosa Lichenbourg for inviting me here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.